Hi, everybody. Uh, this is John Reed with uh, Enterprise Hits and Misses video show, The Great Cloud ERP Benefits Debate Part 2. Uh, part 1 was our scintillating, uh, devastating slideshow event last week. Um, and this is a little bit of a solo fight for now, though I may be welcoming a uh, surprise guest on later. So just so you know, that could happen. Um, but there's a reason why I wanted to come on today. And, and by the way, uh, just so you know, usually I'm going to have a guest on my show, but every now and then I might wing it. Uh, the reason being that, uh, that this particular show requires a little bit of prep for the guests, uh, for the jugular format. And, uh, every now and then I don't have time to get a, a guest fully prepped. Um, but I got some good ones that I'm working on now for you for the weeks to come. Uh, cause I want to introduce you to a lot of people that we can have a good clash of ideas, but anyhow. Uh, I, I do have a little bit of a regret about last week's show, uh, which which was a really good show. I think uh, Brian Summer did a bang up job uh, with his slideshows uh, on basically deconstructing cloud ERP vendor benefits versus what you really get, and how to close the gap, uh, and lots of project lessons and some horror stories as well. Uh, but uh, I think I think my regret about that that particular broadcast was that. I wish I'd done a little bit of a better job of making clear that that it is there is the art of the possible, and I know that Brian believes it too. He, he wrote a book about the importance of uh, digital transformation, so you know it, it does matter. Um, and I'm not sure if we did a good job of getting that across. And it wasn't that we were too snarky. I think I think it was just more we were just being um, very very uh, critical of sort of the hype around. Um, technology and cloud ERP in particular. And of course, it's really difficult to take a topic like cloud ERP because there's a ton of vendors in the space and they're not all doing a good job and they're they're not all serving their customers in the same way. Um, so anyhow, I, I just, I didn't necessarily want to apologize as much as say, I think, I think we kind of missed that a little bit in terms of the tone. And what I'm trying to do in the show is to kind of combine a really healthy kind of snark and cynicism with really hardcore sort of project lessons and then also a little bit of inspiration because I think we need that too. I think, you know, it's morale is not easy right now, let's face it. And um, we're not here just to tear things down. Obviously we, we wouldn't be in this business if we didn't believe that we could make things better. Um, so with that in mind, uh, one of the things I wanted to do here is to walk you through some different models for cloud ERP and how to kind of, how customers think about transformations and how ERP fits into that. Because uh, one of the things I've been writing about on Diginomica lately is that the ERP market is suddenly a lot more interesting than it once was. Because for a while there, it was super freaking boring, let's face it. I mean, it was a bunch of legacy vendors, uh, cloud washing, crappy products, mm -hmm. pretending like they were cloud when they were hosted crap. Um, their partners were milking their customers. And, and it just really wasn't a provocative space to be in uh, when you compared some of the uh, progress that a, a bunch of different SaaS areas, whether it's CRM or HCM, have made um, in the meantime. And but I think I think ERP vendors are starting to catch up because uh, they're starting to figure out that the cloud implies a much deeper transformation, and it also implies uh, a different kind of focus. And it's not always cloud per se, but it's basically thinking about you know basically how do we help our customers do better? Um, hey, Greg. Uh, welcome. Uh, I hope this is useful to you. Uh, I got some ideas to impart, but I'll take questions anytime as usual. So feel free to chime in in the in the chat. Uh, <laughs> Transformation and Cloud Festival. Yeah, I don't think we're, it's a good call it a festival exactly. <laughs> uh, but I do want to walk you through kind of how this all evolved because I think it is sort of sort of interesting. And um, you know, at, at the core of my belief around all of this is that we're not getting enough value out of these. ERP systems and 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 the the reason off rarely comes down to technology. It really comes down to the fact that we're not pushing hard enough to extract the value once we go live, uh, which is something I learned from my uh, departed friend Michael Doan. But it always bears repeating, and it goes back to his green book for SAP, which he wrote many years before cloud cloud ERP was a thing. Um, we're not getting enough benefit after go live is what it comes down to. Um, but there is so much more we can get. Um, however, my view is it requires a, what I call a fierce collaboration between the customer and potentially a vendor partner, um, SI, and the vendor itself. Um, and the best projects have that. And you can tell 
when you meet with those people because you tell the kind of relationships they've forged, kind of forged in fire, so to speak. When I interview folks like that, there's always this honesty to how they talk to each other. And you can tell like, yeah, we kind of been in the trenches of this product together. And we've learned how to talk honestly with each other and not bullshit. And, and that's a really big part, I think, of how, of how these more successful projects come about. Uh, Greg, definitely. It's Friday. It's a festival. Absolutely kick back. Sabir. One of the reasons I do this show on Friday is because I think the style of the show is, is definitely a, a Friday vibe. Um, I just wrote a piece on Digitonomica castigating virtual events yet again for being boring and horrific. And one thing I never want to do on this particular show is, is bore you though. I, I fully acknowledge that when it's just me talking about myself, I'm running that risk. <laughs> uh, so um, anyway, um, before I get into sort of this evolution of cloud ERP benefits for you and walk you through my thinking there, I want to step back and just talk a little bit about when you when it, when a company approaches the issue of transformation, I think they actually have to start by thinking about where they want to go in the long run in their industry. Um, what, what kind of company do they want to be? Um, and how are they going to excel? How are they going to serve their customers better? And, you know, we, we kind of use the word customers now, but it really could be, it really should be employees and partners. It should be everything, right? Like you can use customer in a variety of segments, I guess, in that sense. Um, how are we going to do that? What are we going to stand for? Uh, right. I mean, I think it's, it's really way too, way too problematic in this world right now for companies not to stand for something. I mean, I think, you know, we're going through a period right now where big tech is getting castigated for its sort of conflicting, uh, approaches to uh, privacy versus their business models and 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 so on. Um, ooh, let's see what Greg is drinking. Center of the Universe Brewing in Ashland, Virginia. Oh, Range Blossom Honey Ale. Cheers, Greg. I've only got my water bottle. I didn't even get my coffee going, so we'll see if I can hold up. Um, but anyway, uh, so a company's got to take positions on some things, I think, these days. I mean, some of the companies I like to cover the most, I just I mentioned Zoho in my piece today. They're a privately held company that is really resolute about certain values. Um, and, you know, you can decide whether you like that or not. But in my mind, I find that refreshing. Uh, I think it can be difficult for publicly held companies to take such strong stances, but it can be done. Um, and and then, you know, I think about a company like Acumatic, which is a cloud ERP company I just wrote about, where they have a customer bill of rights that they put out there. And while you might say, well, that's a marketing gimmick, yeah, perhaps, but it's also a transparent way of holding themselves accountable to things like price increases and stuff like that. And so, so, so part of what you're trying to do is figure out what you stand for. And then in most cases, you're going to do a bit of a gap analysis of sorts where you realize like, we probably need to transform and, and keep improving in order to live up to the ideals that we espouse. So you have this core philosophy, but you also have to continue to live up to it all the time. You know, I think that's one thing I f feel really strongly about with Diginomica and my guys, my team there is we, we have to keep changing and we, we have to keep evolving. So yeah, we might have a core of things that we believed in, but we got to always push it. And so I think that's, that's a piece of it too. And then for large enterprises, which is sort of our focus, right? Like now you have to figure out, okay, you've taken a stance on transformation. Well, what type of transformation is it going to be? And what is the role of technology? And obviously technology is going to play a role in it, but I think you have to think about what that means from a future of work perspective, from a robotics perspective, from an AI perspective. Are you going to be all about ruthless efficiency or are you, are you going to, are you going to take a more life affirming position on the future of work? I think these are really, really important considerations. And, um, you know, uh, I think like you, you, there was this thing on, you know, Amazon right now, I, I'm always crushing them for what they're doing with their sort of gig economy approach to delivery, but they have this thing, uh, article recently that I tweeted about how, you know, some of these workers are, are peeing in bottles because they have to meet their metrics while they're driving. <laughs> so, you know, like, to me, that's not a very life affirming vision of the future of work. And you know that as soon as those, you know, humans can be replaced by drones or, or what have you, they're gone. And, you know, so, so, so you have to take some positions on those things. And then within that context, you're going to take a position on ERP and ERP's role in that transformation. And as, and I think that's one of the points that Brian and I were trying to get out last week is that, uh, in, in the case of ERP, the transformation is not always going to be centered around your ERP system as much as the vendors might, might want, want that to be the case. Um, so there is a very strong case I think you can make for 
uh, a modern ERP platform being sort of the driver for your, your transformation. But I think there's an important caveat there that I'll get to in a moment. Um, but there are other, there are other models. Um, the a very common model is the ring fence, your ERP systems model. Um, and there's actually two flavors of that. One is a SaaS vendor flavor and set, you know, SaaS vendors, whether it's, um, you know, uh, Salesforce or any number of SaaS players ha- have taken the position that, you know, transformation, the action lies elsewhere. Um, it lies in supply chain software. It lies in, you know, CRM or customer success software. It doesn't lie in ERP. So yeah, just put your ERP system, put it on some third-party maintenance or put it on some support, let it do what it does. Let it be a back office system and, and we'll pull data out of it um, to, to fuel the transformation efforts. Um, now, what's really, really dangerous for ERP vendors if, if when ring fencing models take hold is that little chunks get taken out, like maybe a vendor like Coupa takes out some of the pre- procurement stuff from the ERP system. Maybe Salesforce takes out the CPQ, configure price quote stuff. So gradually that, 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 that ring fenced ERP gets smaller and smaller. And I think that's one reason why you see ERP vendors like busting their chops to not uh, get caught in, 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 with customers in a ring fence model, but sometimes it happens, right? Sometimes that's what customers want to do and that's how they want to proceed with their transformation. Let's see what Greg has to say about this. It seems like there's a greater board level focus beyond transactional systems, more focus on ROI TCO that enables some kind of differentiator. Now we have some enterprise focus on holding the vendors of ERP more accountable, even possibly holding the SIs accountable. Absolutely, Greg, and that's that's a really big deal. One of the big debates that's come out of the SAP Rise offering, uh, which combines like the hyperscaler and the and SAP on one contract, um, uh, for the purposes of things like upgrading and landscape optimization, is what is the role of SI and how can we make the SIs more accountable? And that's a very very common theme. Um, and and to your point, Greg, the other sort of ring fencing model I think has less to do with transactional SaaS and more to do with analytics. So, for example, I interviewed a customer the other day, a good data customer. The article is not out yet, but but they're doing all kinds of very impressive um, real-time analytics in the transportation sector, and they're pulling from all kinds of back-end systems, including their ERP system. But in this case, you would argue that the analytics vendor is really the strategic vendor of choice here, that, that they're investing the most, and that's what their executives are looking at and their managers are looking at. Um, and I warn ERP vendors about that um, qu- quite a bit uh, because uh, I'm getting pinged on Twitter for something silly. I'll have to look at it later. Um, so, so I warn ERP vendors about this a lot because um, if, if your analytics vendor is really taking over the strategic part of that relationship from you, then you're essentially just a transactional data repository. And Greg, to your point, uh, I don't think you get a lot of traction with your board if you're perceived as just just a transactional system. Now, what are ERP vendors doing to combat that? They're doing any number of things, right? They're they're providing their own analytics tools. I mean, in my mind, where we need to go with that is a much more embedded format because I don't think ERP vendors can totally compete on um, best of breed analytics offerings and best of breed planning offerings. But I think where they can potentially compete is by embedding that type of stuff in the software, that's a lot tougher for the third-party analytics providers to do. So that I'm kind of seeing that information all the time in the context of the screens that I'm working on. And collaboration could potentially work the same way, though there's all kinds of pitfalls in trying to build your own collaboration software, as many ERP vendors have learned the hard way. Um, but there may be some ways of combining that where, in some cases, maybe you partner with with vendors like like Teams or Slack or what have you and figure out how to how to have a bit of both where the user lives out of both a collaboration environment and the ERP environment. But the point is the more the ERP vendors can succeed in making their, their sort of daily interface, the portal for more strategic and collaborative work, not just transactional work, um, the better off um, that they're going to be in the long run to, to combat that, that model. Um, so those are some of the main transformation models that the companies can can undertake. I would argue that there there's a really important additional model that more of them need to look at, which is not ERP as back office or, or modern ERP, but ERP as industry solution, which is really about building out cloud-based industry solutions that are actually as functional as anything on-premise. Um, 
Uh, oh, Dennis is only getting captions. Oh, man, you probably don't want to hear this anyway, Dan. Um, okay. Uh, let's go through a couple of comments. Dennis says he's only getting captions. Sorry, dude. I don't know how to fix that. Um, I guess you could go on to one of the other platforms. Um, I will uh, put a link in there. Um, there's like a, it's running on Facebook Diginomica, Facebook John ERP. It's running on my YouTube channel. And I don't know if there's only uh, captions there, but there might be audio there. Give it a go. So there, there's a link to the YouTube version. Uh, anyway, who knows what the hell is going on with the captions? I don't know what the hell to tell you guys about that. So anyway, those are the different kind of models of transformation. So I, I don't even think uh, companies can even afford to think about ERP in general and what they want to do with it until they've embraced those things around how they want to serve their customers better and, and, and what form of transformation are they going to undertake? What is the role of ERP and all of that? And those decisions are not easy to make, right? And they need to be made in the context of consultation with all kinds of trusted advisors who don't have of uh, any skin in the game as far as selling some massive bloated project. Um, so um, moving a little bit on with, with this whole program, um, this all kind of started for me. I had done spent a number of years on Diginomica documenting cloud ERP use cases. And a lot of them were in the mid-market, uh, which uh, in some ways, you know, mid-market ERP has advantages because you can really put everything on one platform without the legacy spaghetti that the large enterprises have to contend with. Um, but uh, when I initially wrote about cloud ERP benefits, it was, um, let me just tell you what year, 2017, what are the top five cloud ERP benefits? And I said, you know, it's not a miraculous cure-all, but looking back, I see some notable benefits. Um, and so anyhow, I'm not going to go through them in detail, but they have to do with things like getting out of spreadsheet hell, and, and the journey towards a single source of truth, which is something that, that Brian and I thoroughly deconstructed last week as far as how difficult it is to get there. Um, simplifying tools improves adoption. A lot of this is an adoption challenge as well. Uh, so uh, anyway, I had a whole bunch of different use cases that I illustrated. Um, uh, one, of what, one of them was a nonprofit panel for Sage Intact. Uh, where a bunch of nonprofits were stuck on these outdated on-premise systems that um, people had to log into some of them one at a time, for example. And so for companies like that, obviously turning the lights on in a cloud ERP system is, is a huge benefit in and of itself. Um, and then there's the journey away from clunky customizations into platforms and applications. So, um, and then we talk about a modern UI. Well, why do you need that? You need it for talent and recruitment. You need it for productivity. Uh, so, and then data visibility leads to a different way of running the business. And so once you start getting to that, now you're really starting talking about more advanced benefits and it starts with role-based dashboards, obviously, and things like that, but it can get, get much deeper. You can start looking at alerts and decision support and start thinking about, um, what the data is telling you, how you can, uh, I did a piece a little while ago about a, a vendor that, um, they were consulting for, but they ch they totally changed their their services lineup when they finally could see what services were profitable and which are not. Which sounds like obvious, but it's amazing how many companies don't have that visibility. Anyway, those are the kinds of things that that we've seen as kind of a foundation around why these systems can be valuable. But one thing that we keep running into um, at Diginomica is how many of these customers don't ever achieve those things. And so that was kind of the subject of Brian's brilliant slideshow last week. Uh, so um, <clears throat> Den's out. He, he, he's got to have voice. No worries, dude. Uh, but I, I, if anyone else is, is uh caption only, let me know. I'd be curious to know how, how technically dysfunctional that, that is out there. <laughs> So, um, hey, uh, Greg, if you're still watching, um, if, if you have a cam, let me know. Might have you um, come on for a little bit in a little bit, talk, talk about what you're working on. 
Um, but anyway, I wanted to sort of continue along with, with this thread because, so I wrote this piece in 2017, what are the top five cloud ERP benefits? And then, um, in 2018, I wrote cloud ERP isn't an, isn't a handshake deal. It's a value extraction challenge. Here are the stages. And so in that piece, I attempted to really define stage by stage vision of um, how to achieve value in cloud ERP. Now, uh, as Brian Summer pointed out to me, there's a bit of a flaw. Um, oh, switched off. Okay. Thomas says, all good video and audio switched off the annoying captions. Okay. So I guess LinkedIn is serving up caption videos now. I guess they probably think they're being helpful um, to access accessibility and all. Sorry if it's annoying. Um, I didn't realize that before I went live. So there, there might be a way for me to help people adjust that easily, but I don't know. Greg says, analytics within an industry solution is an avenue that ERP vendors miss. They focus on the presentation of analytics, which is important, but the most value is where analytics tie to decision-making. Clarity as to where an analytics set ties to explicit decision is a rare thing in the world or enterprise IT. Greg, I agree with that. And, and one of the things we've been pushing vendors on is how to come up with embedded benchmarks so that throughout your software, when you're working on stuff, you're constantly being made aware of, especially if, it's, if you're a manager in a particular role. Hey, um, you know you're you're five percent off the industry average in this in this area. Or um, did you know that uh, uh, some of some of the other folks in your industry are doing better on you know net net thirty payment terms or what have you? A lot of this information is available, especially for properly run SaaS um, ERP systems. Now you have to overcome certain issues around privacy and data aggregation, but but it can it can be done. Um, but to your point, Greg, um, it's not being done nearly enough. And if, if ERP vendors don't find a way to usefully aggregate, embed, and relay that information to customers, then they're going to lose that strategic uh, vantage point to analytics vendors. And, and then, as I described, customers, as they map their transformation strategies, are going to rank, choose to ring fence their ERP vendors because they won't have a seat at the board table anymore which is sort of to, to your point. Um, let's see what other comments. Um, Greg, you have a camera. Cool. So, so Greg, st um, stand by for a little bit. Um, what I'll probably do is send you a message with a link on LinkedIn, but I want to get through a little more of my material. So hopefully you can hang out for a little bit and then we can talk about it. Um, and then people are asking how to turn the captions off. That's a CC button in the, uh, bottom right of the screen. Um, so I'm glad we got the caption stuff sort of welcome Thomas to the chat. Always nice to have you here, Thomas. I'm in the middle of walking. I'm in the middle of walking through my cloud ERP benefits methodology, but this could also apply to your area of focus CRM in many ways, although you would have to adapt it. Uh, so uh, feel free to chime in and I hope you guys join Thomas in his CRM convos videos, which are quite good. Um, Anyhow, uh, so then in 2018, I wrote the piece, Cloud ERP isn't a handshake deal. It's a value extraction challenge. Here are the stages. And once again, my whole theme was that go live and kind of standardize and simplifying tools and such like that, that's fine, but that's not enough. I mean, you see that in the large enterprise space. I just did a use case interview where a company is bogged down in a global ERP setup where they had so much customization and so much regional variation, so much M&A and activity and so many different ERP systems that, I mean, it was just, they, they're basically not operationally efficient. They're just confused. Um, and they're arguing about numbers all the time. So for them, like, like consolidating all of that stuff into one global standard system is in itself a big benefit. For smaller companies, it has to do with things like getting out of spreadsheet chaos. Um, when you have a single source of truth approach, um, you can do more problem solving um, and, and less trying to gather the numbers and, and struggle with the numbers. And so, so that's the beginning of the benefits, but I think it really levels off a lot of times. And, 
and companies don't take it far enough. And so what I did is I identified first three stages in cloud ERP value achievement. One is the immediate gains, like I talked about, by consolidating disparate systems on a user-friendly platform. The second is increased decision support and benefits of data, vi data visibility in real time via a single source of truth. And dashboarding is a hallmark of this phase, but dashboarding is just a stage in creating truly actionable data. Um, beyond that is stuff, because a lot of folks, look, they don't really like dashboarding and they criticize it. They say it's shiny toys for executives and it's how do you actually make better decisions is the key, right? Um, but beyond dashboarding, you have the potential for it. Alerts, infrastructure, automating routine decisions, and so on. Um, and most ERP customers are not there yet. They're, they're maybe into the dashboarding a little bit, but um, they're not that far. And then the third phase is achieving new business opportunities through a more agile and open platform, um, pursuing new markets by analyzing and applying the data. Um, and very few cloud ERP customers I've ever interviewed are truly knee deep into that third stage. So um, that's why I'm trying to push people to look at this issue and push vendors to do more. Um, anyway, the article breaks out the stages in much more um, detail. One of the big ones is labor reallocation into higher value tasks. So instead of just, just reducing headcount and going for operational efficiency, how can you position people into into roles where they're making more of a difference for customers and employees and so forth. Um, now, um, what happened recently was I decided to revisit this piece because I thought, well, um, you know, what have I missed, right? And so that's sort of where I arrived at recently and why I did that show with Brian last week was the beginning of thinking about, well, it's been two years. Um, what, what else do we need to be talking about here? And I did come up with a few... Um, areas and a few problems. Um, and let's see what we have in the chat. Uh, Thomas says, cloud ERP isn't the main advantage that customers need to rethink how different they really are as opposed to focusing on their specifics. Yeah, well, and I think that's true for a lot of uh, various kinds of software. I mean, um, the whole push to standard is is about acknowledging that you're not necessarily as unique in a lot of your processes and that you should really only be spending money differentiating in areas where you are unique. And beyond that, you should not be disqualifying yourself from future upgrades and absorbing new functionality in order to achieve that uniqueness. Now, one thing I did not mention earlier that fits into the whole transformation philosophy is that what is your IT philosophy is a really big part of that also. Do you even maintain an internal IT team? Do you have development talent? Um, are you going to rely on partners for that? How is that going to work? So that that's the other thing because some, some customers are very, very oriented towards high growth cloud models, don't have a lot of internal IT. Business users run the operation. These are the low code junkies, right? And that's one of the things I didn't get into in my first piece because – well, low code wasn't a thing two years ago as much as it is now. But I mean, I talked about the whole thing around automation and stuff. But uh, I do think I could have spent more time in that last piece on on workflow automation. And since then, I've done a couple of use cases on that topic that fascinated me where business users were able to automate a bunch of workflows without any interference or support from IT. Well, that's a pretty big deal. I think that's a, that's a notable benefit of a cloud ERP Um a modern, what I would consider a modern cloud, cloud ERP product. Um, Greg says, no enterprise is unique as they think they are, especially in the common business functions, supporting their core business reason for existence, absolutely. Um, some very good comments here. Greg, if they, Thomas says, if they can afford to be so, in my experience, many businesses build customizations where industry standard is fine as a place where they invest does not result in positive differentiation. And, and Thomas, this is one of the big things in the ERP universe in, in general that's been a huge problem historically is that there's always a consulting partner willing to build out customizations and 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 uncritically do that for as much revenue as they can make from a client. And hey, maintaining the customizations is fun and expensive work too. Whereas in reality, they should be functioning more like you're describing, which is advising very firmly with customers hey, did you know that this is the standard process in your industry and you should adapt it also and here's why. 
And then here's an area where you really could have competitive advantage. And here's where you might invest either some development resources or what have you. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, Greg responds to Thomas. Yes. Complexity without explicit enterprise value should be a red flag in any organizations, even when it is not it, but when it is it, it grows fast and wild indeed. Yes. And Thomas says when it is not it, it is often yet another cloudy point solution, increasing shadow it. Right. And you know, the, the point solution approach is ultimately going to, going to backfire on, on companies. Um, and, you know, it's really a reaction to the fact that the software that they were being served up is crappy, but the point solution eventually creates more headaches than it solves. And that's absolutely true. Um, so what else is wrong with, with, with my 2018 article on cloud ERP benefits? Uh, well, there's a, there's a few th other things that I found that I, that have changed out significantly for me. So one thing I did um, is I talked about Brian with this, Brian Summer in detail, and he made a really important point, which is that this notion that after you go live, you should keep pushing for benefits. He, he uh, agrees, but he has this caveat, which is that your initial configuration how you initially configure your systems is really important. And he's seen a lot of situations where if you don't anticipate where you're going to go properly, you're going to have to redo all the config later. So that's a really important caveat here to this notion of continuing to advance um, in, in your, in your benefits is that you do have to have a solid vision from the beginning. So that's one really key point that I missed the first time around. I already told you that I missed some of the workflow automation, low code stuff. I should have done a better job with that than I did at the time. Um, and then another thing that I did is I put a call out to vendors to share their maturity models with me because I said, well, cloud ERP vendors, please step up and provide examples of how you're helping customers get to these more advanced stages because too many of them, I think, are, are relaxing into the fact that they don't have to work off spreadsheets and 10 versions of QuickBooks anymore or whatever. But that frankly is, in my mind, not enough. And so the first one to take me up on it was Acumatica. And I interviewed their CEO and they provided their maturity um, model for me, which I published in, in an article you can look at on the site. Um, so it's, uh, it's uh, just do a search for John Reed and Acumatica and cloud ERP value. You'll find it. I'm not going to pimp another link in the chat. I've done enough of that today. Um, so anyway, I, I'd love to see other vendors propose this also and show because one of the things that John Roskell, Acumatica's CEO, acknowledged to me is that they have a chunk of customers who are who are not pushing ahead um, and and they're eager to kind of engage them further in, in what else they can they can do with with the product. Um, the other thing that I think I really missed before that I really like take very very seriously seriously now is this notion of vertical ERP. Um, and to explain that, I want to, you know, I, I've had this whole thing around the future of cloud ERP is vertical. What, what does that really mean? I mean, it's like a catchphrase, but you know, seriously, like how many catchphrases do we need? Um, so I wrote a piece on unit four because they have a new important new ERPX release coming out pretty soon. And I want to read you this paragraph I wrote about industry ERP. Um, and, and a lot of it was based on the fact that unit, unit four is making a lot of play around its next gen microservices based ERP ar architecture. Now I'm not necessarily going to tell you that microservices based architectures are definitively the future, but I, d I would generally agree that a more modern user interface with uh, loads of APIs and ability to play nicely with, with other programs um, and less, <laughs> about any particular discrete area of clunky ERP is going to work better in the long run, exactly how vendors are going to get there. Um, we're going to see. So I'm going to read you this in a sec, but I want to catch up on the chat first because we have a couple of very interesting chatters here between Greg Robinet and Thomas Weimernet. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Greg says, Maybe the SI model for charging should include an explicit value-based cost value formula that if the value is not delivered, the SI does not get paid. 
Well, I totally agree with that. And there has been a little more of a pursuit of outcome based models. And I don't think we've heard the end of it yet. Um, you know, uh, some, some, uh, roadblocks I've seen come up to that uh, for obvious reasons, but I don't think we've heard the end of outcome based consulting. Um, Thomas says he agrees. The challenge with this is the same as software vendors not going into value-based pricing indeed. But it may be the kind of thing where a disruptive uh, vendor can step in and, and do that. So, uh, Greg, I'm going to send you a video link in just a few minutes and have you, have you come on to this discussion. But before I do that, uh, I want to um, share with you guys this take that I did on this Unit 4 piece because it illustrates uh, – this is, now, now keep in mind when I read this to you, it, this is really not about the pros and cons of unit four that I want you to take away from this. It's the industry piece. So um, anyway, they talked a lot about the sub verticals that they want to cover. I said, many cloud ERP companies speak in terms of next gen architectures these days, intelligent platforms, multi-tenancy, workflow automation, low code and such. Alas, some still use glossy language to cloud wash legacy architectures, or they talk of private cloud solutions even your grandmother wouldn't host. I tend to believe, however, that in a longer view, and this is a, the really important point, modern ERP architecture will be table stakes, a requirement for vendors to compete, which is contrary to how most marketing departments for ERP vendors, by the way, uh, position themselves now. Will Unit 4 be able to stay out in front of that, perhaps, if they pursue their market services-based automation plans with vigor, since only a handful of ERP vendors are talking microservices right now? So then I say, well, what's the obvious question, right? The obvious question is, if ERP vendors don't ultimately win based on modern, modern architecture, well, then how will they excel? I believe the ERP winner circle of the future will be all about vertical niches. That means providing software that not only runs your back office, this is the really important point here, but your industry software without undue functionality compromises when you move from your proprietary industry software. And you, you guys know what kind of industry software I'm talking about. Like a lot of times it's old school green screen legacy stuff. It's so difficult to integrate. Shop floor systems uh, almost always qualify for this. Uh, all kinds of shop floor machinery that can't talk to anything else. It might not even be on the MES system. The MES system can't talk with the ERP system. Uh, that's something that Plex is trying to break down, by the way, the breakdowns between MES and ERP. I just wrote about IFS. They're trying to do the same with EAM, asset management, same kind of stuff, uh, break down the walls between that and, and ERP on the service of a more real-time view of servicing the customer put field service management in there as well and get rid of all the three letter acronyms entirely. Uh, but anyway, with the industry so software silo eradicated, you can get really serious about automating processes, pulling analytics and layering AI and collaboration tools on top of that. And the point here is you can't call that kind of ERP back office because your vertical system is now fully integrated into that. And I know ERP vendors will claim that they have that today, but in, in, in a lot of industries, especially in micro verticals, very specific vertical segments, that doesn't exist in a modern format. Um, so it's now your business background. And another key point, it's not just software. It's absolutely not just software. Pulling that off means assembling advisory services partners who are expert in that industry, customer success teams for that industry, and eventually user communities around each sub vertical. That combination just doesn't exist in many industries and micro verticals today. And so that's the key point I want to make today about what I kind of missed in my last piece a couple of years ago that I think is so critical now. Um, yes, some, some customers aren't thinking industry ERP yet, even though they're updating their ERP, but they absolutely should be because you really can't talk about, don't give me any AI bullshit if, if, you, if you can't um, have an integrated easily modernized industry and ERP system. And in most cases, I think they should be combined. Perhaps in some cases they'll be separate, but in general, if ERP vendors want to be relevant, which is the whole thing we're talking about, about modern ERP, I think they need to tackle industry and not just be finance. If they're just going to be finance, they're probably going to be back office. I mean, what Brian talked about last week about cost accounting and why cost accounting needs to get much more sophisticated for the factory of the future. That implies that the two systems talk to each other and that the cost accounting and the 
manufacturing software coexist in a in in a har harmonious way. Otherwise, you can't have modern cost accounting at all. Okay, now I'm going to bring uh, Greg on in just a couple minutes. Greg, I'm going to uh, hang on one sec, guys, and keep commenting for a moment. I am going to pull an invite link for you. And Greg, I'm going to find you on LinkedIn right now. And LinkedIn's taking a little while to load. Sorry, folks, this is real time life. Let's see, let's see if Greg's already in my messages. Greg, no, you are not. Why not? Greg Robinette, there you go. Greg Robinette, and I'm going to message you now. Greg, I just sent you the uh, back end login link. Just go ahead and log in there, and then I'll pull you onto the live stream. And now I'm going to catch up on the comments. Thank you, folks, for waiting for that. Let's see. Uh, LinkedIn user says, everything you have said is spot on. I'm struggling to comment without just saying, yeah, I'm working on it. Well, look, we're all working on it. I mean, some of this is somewhat ambitious. And uh, actually, I'm planning, I'm planning a show coming up on sort of future ERP and what that's going to look like. But that's a different show. Um, Greg, I'll be pulling you on in just one sec. Uh, uh, thanks for the Acumatica CEO link, Mark. I, I appreciate that because I didn't want to pimp anything else into the chat today. But if you want to pimp, pimp it, that's great. And there is Greg. Greg, Hello. can you hear me? I can hear you. Can are you, you can excellent? You? Yes, you are live, Greg. Thank you. How exciting! Yeah, this is nice. Uh, Greg, Greg, and I have have quite a bit of history. I think um, I was I met you. I was it when I was at the editor of uh, SAP Tips. Was yes. That one? Yeah, and you wrote some fantastic HR articles back old school SAP HR. Yeah, back so a while ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, so what kind of projects do you work on these days? So I'm, I'm, uh, actually with one of my original clients when I started doing SAP consulting, Newport news shipbuilding in, uh, Newport news, Virginia, we build aircraft carriers and submarines, cool. a so very old school SAP customer. Yeah. Yeah. Going back yeah. to 1999. And, um, I mean, we've got some, some really good positive things with SAP and of course some of the things that are, are tougher, but um, right now we, we just got done with a, an S4 conversion, um, the Brownfield conversion. Of, I believe we were the first A&D customer to do everything, not just finance. So it was a very interesting. Um, and, you know, I, I, I probably have a reputation for bashing the ERP vendors every now and then and the SIs, yeah, yeah. but I will say, you know, we rely on SAP as a core product. It does a great job for what we do. It's very complex to build an aircraft carrier. Just so you, to give the scale of it, it's, um, I, I can't, it's in the tens of millions of uh, hours of work, which you have to track to a contract detail level. And it's billions and billions of parts. And a part for an aircraft carrier may not be the same price as a part for a destroyer or a submarine. So every individual piece of inf information tied to each individual part that goes into building a ship has its own unique characteristics. And all of that is tracked by SAP. So it's very powerful. It does work. Now, having said that, we, we do struggle sometimes with dealing with the legacy choices we made. So mm. that's kind of where I'm at right now, what I'm doing. So Very interesting. And and when you when you talk about like, legacy choices without getting too specific on your project necessarily. What do you think like old school in this case, SAP, it could be any ERP, but in the case of SAP, what, what kind of legacy choices do customers grapple with? Like they got this great functionality right in your vertical that SAP built, but what are the legacy aspects that can be difficult? So, and whether it's SAP or any other vendor, they, they have a design, a, a functional design for their product. Mm -hmm. And once you start customizing it and you start building on top of that as the years go by, the assumption when they come present you with new functionality is that you have in some way incorporated their, their core design. So mm -hmm. wherever you've customized or even in the, in the, in 
you know, user controlled configuration items that aren't like code customization. Right. They assume you're going to use a certain foundational pattern or, or design for that. And when you don't, you get all this new functionality, which is often presented at, at, at senior levels. And it's like, oh, this will work great. And then when you go to look actually having to deploy it, the foundational configurations may not exactly work. And so you go take a look at what those trigger. And then, of course, all your custom code, in our case, it's over 20 years worth of you know SAP time. All your custom code was designed, developed and deployed with that foundational configuration. And that was one of the issues we ran in with uh, S4. And I will say SAP provided some really good tools for when we went through to analyze everything. They actually have come up with a pretty nice suite of tools to do the S4 conversion. And we were able to identify a bunch of custom code because we had 20 years under our belt. Millions and millions of line of custom code that we were able to resolve um, through the S4 project. And that, that sets us for a foundation going forward. Now, part of the way you get there is if anybody was around a while back in the ni late 90s and early 2000s, there's a lot of deployments of all ERPs that were Oh, you want to take your old system and make it be the same in our new system? Yeah, we can do that for you. And it, it's based upon the model of billable hours. So I, I do still run into that, and that's a problem. So recovering from that binge of customization and we can build your old system in the new system, even if it doesn't make any sense, from 1997, 98 through about 2010 in my experience, that 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 is a, a big cost item. I don't I don't think companies really think about that until they get into the nuts and bolts of yeah, like moving to the cloud. Um, well, whatever. I, I my experience with uh, AWS is more just research, but some of the tools I've seen there, um, you know, you can you can really bypass some of the historical legacy issues that you may have built for your enterprise. Um, and that's what I think some of the cloud opportunities are. And I don't know that they've been marketed particularly well because it's hard to break away from the traditional marketing from, you know, the early 2000s, the first, the, the previous, the, the first 20 years of the 2000s, there's a specific marketing perspective that I think the ERP and the ecosystem built around them use. And that, that's a dynamic that needs to shift where, tie more to value when we were talking about the vertical, the industry verticals, you have a ring fence back office. If you're a good, you're one of the legacy ERP companies who specialize in verticals and you come up with a differentiated vertical, you'll win that market. I, I just, nobody wants to screw around with having to rebuild integrations, even if it requires exactly. resolving the legacy stuff, because at some point, whether you bounce off of your current ERP or go to another one, you're going to have to deal with that legacy stuff. Um, yep. Absolutely. Mark has a quick comment about um, my Ollie picture. Yes, uh, it is one of the greatest sports photos. It's, 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 I have a small collection of sports photography. This one's my favorite. Um, and then Greg um, Thomas says, what do you do there? Variant config on a grand scale? <laughs> no, I, I, I'm involved in <laughs> variant config on a grand scale. It's not a bad way to describe it. I'm, I'm the what we call the tower systems architect for all things. Um, it's called ERP solutions. It's not just SAP, but it spans across SharePoint and a bunch of other integration components. So it's a, a little bit bigger uh, where I was SAP specific as a consultant. And then when I came here, that was my, my role, but I've morphed into a bigger role uh, as an example for our S4 project. I pretty much was the cutover lead and the solution design guy and, whether it's third-party add-ons or our foundational levels, of just managing all that, it just takes a lot of time. And, you know, we had a good team. So I'm pretty pretty amazed, actually. You know, when you're in the middle of a big project like that, it's like this can't possibly be successful. And as you grind through it, uh, we actually came out of it pretty well. And actually really a pretty good effort by our company and with some help, well, we got it done. Congrats. It's a, definitely a major achievement especially given the mission critical stuff that you produce. So um, were there any um, uh, surprising lessons? I mean, I, I know that there's classic lessons around like change management and we already covered the custom code thing, but anything surprised you that you were like, Oh my gosh, I wish I'd paid attention to that. Personally. Yeah. But that's just because I didn't pay attention to what I should have. Uh, but overall for a project um, just kind of, more internal cultural stuff. We, we, you know, we're, uh, 
we have one customer. So anything that affects the relationship with that customer, everybody's very careful about. And there was a lot. I mean, uh, if you haven't been through an S4 conversion, it essentially resets your all the underlying data and structures for your finances. It is a pretty big deal. So when you go do that, the, both the business and your customer are very interested in how that works out. And mm. we, we did. I, it actually went really well. It was a lot of diligence by both the business and IT working in partnership. Uh, which you know, no no company always has that. Uh, we just were able to say this is important, and everybody got aligned to it. Uh, some of the bigger surprises were as we we're going through it, um, just matching up foundational elements like your product versions, your component versions with third parties. The way things are released is the third party providers get that at the same time you do. So we're going and we were pushing our schedule. We were working to, to move. We were right on the cutting edge. We were in 1909 and it came out in, I think, September, and October. We were installing it in our first cutover, uh, first, first, you know, uh, sandbox system. And we do have third party products that provide specific value. And we're, we're, we're like, OK, have you got this done yet? Have you got this done yet? Um, and so we were able to, you know, that that was a little bit where I, you in my experience and I thought maybe I, I'm wrong, but that SAP worked with the third-party vendors and like kind of gave them a pre-release and allowed them a, a little ramp-up time that didn't appear to happen. Yeah, you know, and w- what's interesting about what you described is that I think you're part of the way towards achieving the values I was talking about. And it's it's a big victory for a vendor like SAP to get you to this point because before you're in, a, in the legacy versions – now you're on S4, and in the process, you've gone through some pretty painful standardization exercises. The thing that helps you going forward is even though you're not like full cloud or what have you, you're in a much better position still to absorb new functionality. And, and secondly, now you can really look at the data platform aspects and really look at what you can do from an analytics standpoint and, 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 and how you can pull data more easily from the system or attach to collaboration tools like you described there's a lot of things you can talk with SAP about now that you couldn't before. But I think what's interesting about it is that it's still on the vendor, in this case SAP, but it could be any ERP vendor, to demonstrate now what it can do for you. Like, so in my mind, it's not over yet, right? Like we think, oh, we're live on S4, but it's like, in my mind, if you do this right, this is just the beginning. And if two years from now you and I are talking, we should be having a totally different conversation about the value you're achieving. So one of the business drivers was being able to um, utilize some new functionality that SAP has in the uh, planning, engineering, and operations. Mm-hmm. That was, and, and that's, and that's. I can't really go into a lot of the details, but that that is one of the key things. And, and SAP has been a great partner in figuring that out. Um, it's a tricky area. Uh, just want to mention to folks too is we don't really have the option of using cloud products as most companies do. So right. We're very, very restricted in exactly. our, our security footprint. So everything we do is generally something that's within our span of control. So yep. um, some of the options that might be there that just make common sense to a lot of other companies is not really available to us. So that is always a challenge for us. And I would say SAP was a very good partner in understanding that. And that's not true of all vendors. They're like, well, why don't you just let us do this? I'm like, Sorry, can't. So I, yeah. I, I would like to throw them a little little compliment for that. Yeah, I I, I cut a uh, I cut aer- aerospace and defense companies a lot of slack when it comes to their resistance to cloud, where I usually give companies a hard time about what I consider sort of fake privacy and data concerns. But aerospace and defense is a different story entirely. Um, what what do you think about sort of the impact of collaboration on your company and your industry? Because like obviously especially in the remote workforce, but in general, like collaboration tools have really taken hold. Uh, What, what does that look like for you guys? So it's more like working groups. And I've seen an uptick in like reaching out and having not, not conferences, but meetings with people. It's still, they're still fairly siloed within the industry. I think there's some huge opportunities as a total pivot. Um, I'm going to say this and you can't get mad, but Okay. There's a there's there is a value based. Oh, you said pivot. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not just pivot. This one. This yeah. is the one. A oh, value based use for blockchain. 
Oh, here we go. Oh, not, man. Not related oh. to cryptocurrency at all. Okay. You're treading then, on treading on thin ice with know, blockchain yeah. use case. Let's hear about your blockchain use case, Greg. So Let's hear a about lot it. of aerospace and defense requires, essentially, it's a form of supply chain provenance. But it, it requires being able to show that the source of whatever it is, even sometimes back to the foundational materials, your steel or your, your raw materials, all the way through the delivery for very specific things within a contract, you have to show up to like drawings. It has to have physical signatures. I've, I've seen some of them um, that have books that are like two or three, three ring binder books that are like 12 inches by 14 inches. And then they're eight or nine inches thick of simply of signatures, acceptances and transfers. It's a huge overhead. Um, and that's how the, the contracting requirements are met. Every single one of those signatures and stuff, I, there's nothing really technologically preventing a group of uh, a and suppliers that are partnered together to say, we're going to form our own uh, distributed ledger that links just this particular supply chain. Mm -hmm. And every transaction you could take, say, say, take a picture of, you know, some whatever, some, some piece of information that's relevant to the, the component. And then that becomes, goes into your uh, distributed ledger that this, this group is in, somebody validates it. You've got the immutable signature from a blockchain. Now I don't need to take a picture or wait for me to pass the book along or FedEx it or whatever they do. It goes with the material and it's a scannable thing. I mean, there's a, a, lot, a lot of different ways to, to look at it. Just on my own, I kind of been playing around um, with uh, like non-fungible token type things that you could actually attach to things not because that's generated and linked to the blockchain. And I, I don't know enough of the technical components that I may not be describing it right, but the concept fits. And all of a sudden we've reduced a whole lot of non-value overhead. The only value right now is the provenance value, which is important from a contract perspective. But if we can take all of that clutter that ties that together out and streamline it to an electronic immutable trace uh, transfer, that would be great. I mean, if I had spare time, I would, you know, try to figure that out in value terms for, for not just our organization, but other ones. But that that's kind of one of the things I would look at. Well, first I got to give you applause because you got away with using the words pivot and blockchain within 15 seconds of each other on my show without getting booted off cam. Um, and, and, and look, um, I, so, so with the blockchain piece, do you know of any, is there any pilots going on in your industry around this or just people kind of loosely talking about it or where are you at? I think there are, I just have not had time to really reach out and, and look at anything. I mean, I was so interested. I went ahead and, you know, kind of studied it up and worked some hyper lever, hyper ledger fabric things. And there were some, some folks that responded back to when I was talking about it, but I, I just haven't had the time. I hope so. I mean, you know, it's just my personal interest. I think it's really a high value for a lot of different companies within the A&D space, you know, a consortium where everybody was using the same kind of distributed ledger where you come up with how that would work. You know, if I, if I was running a line of business still, um, that's something I'd say, okay, let's invest that. Let's, let's, uh, I think it's a multi-million dollar target that you could do and it would be worth some investing and putting together, you know, a consortium, but I don't do that anymore. So <laughs> I'm focused on, you know, getting the uh, chips built by having the good systems. But it, it, when it, when my mind is awake at night, it intrigues me and something I would want to do. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's kind of, fits in with kind of why I have steered away from blockchain talk on the show for the most part, which is not people think it's like a hostility to blockchain. It's really more that I'm trying to focus on what people are already using at scale. And, and obviously in this case, we don't even have a pilot project to talk about yet, but I don't object to the use cases when they're clearly defined in an industry setting. And especially when you, when you look at if there's a community of say suppliers that share a collective need for transparency that is a prime candidate for some form of distributed ledger technology. There's no doubt about it. And when, when we actually have production at scale, you'll hear a lot more about it on this show, but I certainly don't mind hearing Greg's ideas about it because I love hearing more about the industry use cases. I mean, you guys have to understand with the blockchain thing that about four years ago, I went to a show 
where I was told that blockchain was going to be bigger than the internet itself. Um, so I'm still working my way down from the Mount Everest of that hype factor into what I think of as the future of blockchain, which is one more tool in your toolkit that you would approach in a very sober manner, along with many other tools to figure out if it's the right tool for your job. Um, and we may not be able to because it's linked with a uh, cryptocurrency craze. You know, it, it just may be. Yeah, it's, exactly. not magic. it's not magic and it requires some investment and understanding it. And it has not been presented thoroughly as, hey, this is really a technological solution that is better than other ones. It's been yeah. magic. And the, other, and the other really interesting thing, um, Kurt Marco, if you guys follow his stuff on Diginomica, he – he does a really excellent job on the more tech side of analysis on our site. He just did a piece on uh, Oracle's use of blockchain in, in a security context to enhance security and some of their database functions. So that's a really good example of taking some of the blockchain characteristics and applying it to an existing problem, which I think is, and that, that it, when that happens, that's a productive use case right now. Um, but again, that's, that's, that's not about revolutionary technology. It's about getting better and using every tool at your disposal to get better, which unfortunately is not nearly as sexy. Thomas wants me to invite Jeremy Epstein to my show, quite an outspoken advocate of blockchain and marketing and ad tech. Oh, that sounds like he and I would get along great. You know, I love ad tech as well. So um, that's, that's going to be really, really, really perfect um, for me. So thanks. Thanks Thomas for that. So uh, do you guys have any last questions for Greg? I think Thomas was really curious to hear more about the construction of ships. <laughs> Let me see what his question was there, whether you can actually answer without getting in trouble. Um, his question was more about different pricing and the planning of building a big ship. I don't know if there's anything there you want to touch on. but um, It's a pretty amazing process. Um, I was in the Navy before I got involved in all this mess uh, and having been lived on a ship and having to be dependent upon it all coming together. Um, it gave me a different perspective when I finally started working with Newport News. So when I go on the ships and I see all this, it's there's, there's a thread of how it all ties together, which is pretty amazing. Um, the design starts and, you know, I think the Ford aircraft carrier was 12 years from design. Yeah. So, you know, you're a Navy guy too. Um, but the, it was 12 years from design to where they had the, the ship floating. Um, it's and, amazing. Uh, yeah, it's it's just an amazing feat. And you know, we we're all no matter what industry you're in, contracts are executed in different ways. And you know, the government and the Department of Defense have a specific way. So when you're building things, each contract's unique. And even if you're using common materials, uh, you you it's tied to the contract. So you want to make sure because you all everybody wants to get paid that you line it up so that it is correct for the contract purposes. And it's, it's one of those things where people look at some of the DOD processes and they're like, oh, that's crazy. It, it may be. Some of them are out of whack completely. But at the end of the day, a lot of them really tie back to, you know, delivering what was asked for correctly. And so some of the functionality uh, and it, SAP provides some pretty good functionality. I'll give them a little bit of a plug. The grouping, pegging and distribution functionality and their MRP stuff is super strong. So that's almost an industry specific thing for us that you can't function. You can't build a ship in the modern world. And I would think it would apply to aircraft, but I don't know that as a fact um, without being able to figure out what needs to be where uh, for your MRP perspective and making sure that when it's consumed, you, you track it well and price it correctly. So the billions of parts involved in these major defense systems, it just gets so complex that, without having some really strong background IT systems, it wouldn't work. That plus the people who understand how it has to fit. They, they, they can see a problem that shows up. That's what's unique about our workforce is it doesn't matter where you are on the deck plates, uh, whether you're a welder or whatever, everybody's tasked with kind of the quality perspective. And they'll recognize things that aren't within, you know, this is, I like to think it's universal across our company that every shipbuilder looks at it this way. They'll recognize things that are that don't seem to be aligned with you know, whatever they're working on. And it's pretty easy to call it out. Uh, and our systems support that. And these things are so big and have to work. Uh, speaking as a Navy guy who lived on a ship, who had some ships that didn't work and we're out in the middle of the Atlantic, it wasn't a really fun feeling. So, 
No, um, I, I would, I would think not. I would think not at all. So, so Greg, I mean, you've been at, you've been at this ERP thing for a long time. How, how do you kind of keep yourself kind of fresh? You seem to have a lot of fresh ideas and thoughts and concepts. How do you keep on the edge of everything for yourself? Professionally, I've been very affiliated with SAP. So I, you know, when you, with ERP tips yep. and all that, you know, that that's part, one of the reasons I did that was so I could stay connected. I'm lucky to have a really strong network within that, that I can reach out and um, mm. work with that. Other than that, personally, I like to challenge myself. So when new technologies and things come along, like I, I didn't know much about cloud. So I started getting into AWS components and, and talk to people that I knew that was at AWS and ended up going ahead and working to get certified as an, a solution architect and still do some dabbling and helping some people out with like storefront companies and some lamp stuff. But mostly it's just being interested in the cutting edge. And, um, you know, that's one of the reasons I will give a plug for Diginomica is there are things I'm not aware of when I read Diginomica. It's like, that's interesting. And depending on where I am in my cycle of I have energy to explore or I don't have energy to explore. It's like one of the sources that I'll go find out. So mostly it's, it's an innate curiosity and a willingness to, to review and examine things. So really just, I like to do it. So I do it. <laughs> yeah. I like that model of you have this core thing you're really good at, but you're always trying to spike it up with new ideas. And I think that's, that's kind of how ERP guys stay interesting to me. Sounds like we're uh, starting to get some domestic interruptions over there, Greg. We got a animal, my first animal interruption in the history of the show. This is exciting. Excellent. Yeah. Nelson, the dog, was in here and he was getting ready to bark. And oh, Nelson. Cool. So, some other person was outside the door and he wanted to be out there with him. So, so I mean, guy, I don't know what you all think about this thing, but it was pretty cool because here I am going on a rant about why cloud ERP needs to be vertical. And then lo and behold, I got a vertical ERP fellow on my chat um, to talk about the importance of uh, vertical and, and A&D. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Cause I think that is really the, the future to your point. And, you know, you have that in your industry, but in a lot of industries that doesn't exist yet. And, um, and it, it needs to, I think if, if these ERP vendors are going to live up to their, their, bold claims that they're driving transformation. I also think the uh, use of cloud across the board, there's uh, um, lots of, uh, I'm trying not to use a word that'll get me yelled at, um, lots of commonality in focus of where the cloud is actually more secure than an on-prem system and where the, the risks are and how do we build out um, areas that that can be shared by air, you know common groups like uh, Gov Cloud in both Azure flavors and the uh, AWS. I might have the, not have the terms exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, those of that work with the government may be surprised. They've actually done a pretty good job at trying to pull together a framework that allows agencies, contractors to work in that. I, I think that has a lot of potential for. You know, you're only as good as your weakest IAM group, whether you have the most secure cloud infrastructure or not. If you don't protect your cloud assets by explicitly finding the vulnerabilities and, you know, those are the, the biggest one is who you let in with permissions because it's complex and none of the cloud stuff comes magically. You've got to go learn it. and You've got to go deploy it correctly. And many people get enamored of how rapid it can be or how quick I can deploy a solution without looking at there's still the fundamental principles of cybersecurity, yep. user identity access management. But if you ignore that, it doesn't matter how cool your functionality is, it's at risk. And, and that's a, and I think actually all the cloud hyperscalers in the past couple of years have actually focused on, yeah, you we can't do that for you. Here's the principles you need to, to follow. And if you read the, the documentation that Google, I'll, I'll mention Google, Azure, and Amazon put out, all of it is extensive and gives you enough information that if you take the time to learn it, you can probably set a cloud system up that is secure as your on-prem, but you've got to do the work. 
And a lot of times that's just not sexy, uh, classy work. It's grunt work. It's going in and digging through and, and building out that foundation correctly. Uh, when most people want to hit a button and get a fancy app that gives me analytics and magically fixes my biggest business problem. Well, and to your point, one of the, you know, I'm always in enterprise hits and misses security breaches and cloud security or theme just about every week. And right now we have this um, Microsoft ex- exchange hack issue where there's, you know, 30,000 businesses in North, in North America alone um, that, that have now been in, inflicted with this hostile malware shell and, and the, you know, Krebs on security is talking about how anyone who doesn't get these systems updated um, they're, they're, they're going to get a mass uh, ransomware hit pretty quick here. And um, that's going to be really miserable. And, and a lot of these are public service organizations and things like that. And what have they done? Well, they've fallen behind on patching. And, and, and to your point, like the lack of sophistication around that is, 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 is really dangerous. And, um, you know, as I do remind people, sometimes uh, Brent Snowden walked out with a thumb drive with a lot of stuff on it too. So, uh, you know, that, you know, security is a multifaceted thing, but I think one thing you bring up, Greg, which is probably a topic I should do a whole show on is this whole notion of security by design, which is like, why can't we have this conversation about security interwoven in all of our conversations? Right. Um, and I would include data privacy in that as well. Um, why can't that just be part of everything we do? I've had a lot of arguments with vendors about that because I had one prominent vendor tell me, Oh, well, I don't, we're not going to bring up security on the main stage. Cause that's just an invitation to be hacked. And I was like, Oh, come on. Like you have to bring this stuff up. Not, I, I didn't say like, go up there and say, Oh, we're an impenetrable fortress. You know, we dare you to hack. Our, I didn't say that, but I was saying like, it, it's time to just bring this up and get out in front of it and say, we care about this and we're working on it. And, and, and also from Greg, to your point, from a customer's perspective, what are you doing to make sure that you've dealt with these configurations? Because a lot of the default configurations are not secure enough. So anyway, it's an ongoing conversation and we should definitely have it on this show as well. So very good, man. Well, I like how you danced around a few topics so we wouldn't get in trouble with your PR people. So that was good. And it's really, really nice to have a chance to talk to you. It's been a long time. I, used to love editing your articles back in the day. So, Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I'm glad I, 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 I don't know, a few weeks ago I said, I need to start doing this. And it's the timing's good. It's Friday afternoons and it gives me a chance to, to unwind a little bit intellectually. Absolutely. Well, we'll definitely uh, have you on again. I want to thank my commoners for, for joining this impromptu session. I've got a really fun one next week on, on cloud projects and and dealing with cloud vendors and negotiating tactics and one of the big themes there is that hey cloud vendors are pain in the ass too and uh you know there there's no there's no dream on the other side of this it's just a different form of lock-in but on that inspiring note (laughs) let's head off into the better weather for those of us that have finally achieved that for those of you that haven't i don't know what to tell you hopefully you'll get it soon it's so much warmer here than it has been. So feeling kind of happy about that. Probably for you too, right, Greg? A little bit nicer there. Oh, oh yeah. It's it's it was a gorgeous day. Um, perfect. All right. Well, I hope Nelson gets outside again. And have a great night. Thanks for joining. Bye everyone. I'll catch you next Friday. See you later. <laughs>